So, folks, I, in, in lieu of my normal greeting, which is kick those tires, start that virtually fake fire, as you've noticed on the Ryan Bethay Show, formerly went camping, we are addressing more and more esoteric topics. And, of course, just I'm bringing on people that I find just interesting. Recently, I happened to make the acquaintance of... Now, I was going to call him a monk, but that's not technically uh, correct because he doesn't live in a cloister, and I was going to affectionately nickname him the Uptown Monk. But that is not accurate. It would be more accurate for me to say that this man is on Friar... That was for you, Evan. <laughs> he is a Dominican, a theologian, a priest, a father in the Catholic Church. When God called him and said, do you want to be an OP? He said, yes, you know me. Please <laughs> welcome Father Gregory Pines. He is also a guest lecturer, would be the correct term, contributor with Pines with Aquinas. He has a very cool outfit. Um, you can tell between the two of us which one of us is Catholic and which one of us is not. So please <laughs> welcome Father Gregory Pines to the podcast. Hello, sir. Hey. Cheers. Thanks. Ryan. That's a nice that's a nice introduction. I would say it's top five introductions I've received. One of the best introductions that I've ever received include a variety of falsities. But because they're funny falsities, they were fine, which um, I think it made the it made the claim that I am fluent in. And then it named a bunch of languages, some of which were true, some of which were false. But my favorite of which was parcel tongue. Um, so <laughs> I guess well, that now, means he- I. Well, you did bring up Harry Potter, and uh, obviously that's a controversial subject. Um, and so I think we should establish this right off the bat, because a lot of Protestants don't yeah. understand that within Catholicism, there are houses, if we'll call them affectionately, <laughs> right? So uh, there are various fraternities, fraternal organizations, which, yeah. I mean, essentially they are akin to houses in uh, Harry Potter, right? And yeah. I would say that you are Dominican, which is the order of preachers. And so would you say that being called a Ravenclaw is the most apt characterization of your fraternity? Yeah, I I think so. Although the problem with the analogy is that everyone is sorted into a house in Hogwarts, whereas not everyone in the Catholic Church is sorted into a religious order. So I think that it'd be more accurate to say that I'm like part of the Ravenclaw Quidditch team. Got it. Uh, So like I'm a particular kind of Catholic, but a subset of those Catholics who aren't necessarily more athletic, because as far as I can tell, there's no correlation between athleticism and broom riding. I think it's more kind of magic than it is, you know, acquired talent. Um, so yeah, I'm going to go with, I'm going to go with Quidditch player. Okay. So basically, you know, and again, and one thing I have found really cool because I, you know, when I met you at this uh, retreat, I noticed that, you know, there are typically Catholics I find, uh, adorn much more ornate clothing styles. I have found, uh, the flip flops and shorts, which, uh, which uh, of course are customary in my unique practice of theology, <laughs> which I will say not truthfully is an attempt to emulate the founder. Right. I would argue that, you know, my outfit when I wear sandals to Uh church on Sundays, sometimes I feel like that's, you know, really putting me in touch with how things were in the Judean desert. But uh, I was I was interested to notice that obviously there's some guys walking around in these white robes. And of course, I said they're either wizards or they are part of some really cool club that I'm not a part of. So uh, (laughs) tell us, what is it? What is a Dominican? Um, Help those who have no context for this understand just what exactly it is and why you have the cool initial OP. I wanted to make it OPP, but uh, obviously no naughty by nature uh, references are appropriate. Nice. Yeah, it's it's rare that early 90s rap becomes pertinent in the context of a theology discussion. But then again, it's rare that you talk about the show has just started. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Let's 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 go. so, uh, what is it a minute? So I'm a Catholic and I'm a priest. Priests typically come in one of two categories. And um, so you have what we refer to as diocesan priests who are attached to a particular region or diocese and then religious priests who are attached to a particular religious order within the history of religious life in the Catholic church. You have the earliest expressions of it in the third century. So you've probably heard of St. Anthony of the desert. Um, he kind of did the solo piece, which we would call the life of a hermit or the eremitical life. But he had a contemporary, St. Pacomius, who did the community piece, uh, what we would call the cenobitic life. We just use or invent fancy words so as to make people who don't know them feel less about themselves. Um, Mission so, accomplished. <laughs> bingo. Blammo. <laughs> Could you explain yeah, just what those last three words were that you said, please? I won't make you spell yeah. them, but uh, what, does those, what do those terms mean? Yeah, so their medical life is you live alone. You're a hermit uh, or an anchorite is another. These are all words that you might have come across. A great place to look is just the first chapters of the rule of St. Benedict because he lists different expressions of religious life there. And then Cenobitic life is life in common. So you have different people who come together to live a life intentionally in community. 
And so the earliest expressions of that would be monasticism, and people who practice this type of way of life are called monks. Um, and if you've heard of like Benedictines or Cistercians or Trappists or whomever else, you know, those are all monks. And then around about 12th, 13th century, you have a new movement in the church. And the basic idea was let's move the monastery as close as possible to the city center. And let's take on a preaching apostolate, like a preaching ministry, which goes outside of the walls of the monastery. And not just because we have to, because they're out there saying and pag pag like pagan people are um, either, you know, at risk of being lost or Christian people are at risk of, of like kind of being corrupted or deceived or whatever else. But it's like intentional. It's part of the, it's part of the idea. So then we call this the, the mendicant movement, which means beggars. Uh, or we call it the Friars Movement, just taken from the word that means brothers. Um, and that would be like the Dominicans and the Franciscans. Franciscans are probably the ones that people know the best because of Robin Hood, Friar Tuck, St. Francis of Assisi, etc. I don't know why Friar Tuck would be my first referent, given that he is <laughs> fictional. Um, but alas and alack, here we are. Um, and then you have other things that happen in the modern period. And besides, and when a Catholic says modern, he typically means 15th, 16th century and beyond. Um, so that is the lay of the land. I hope that's sufficiently boring. Okay. So that explains. And so within Catholicism are these unique expressions that just have unique, I want to call it, uh, ministries or goal, but just expressions. Um, and they highlight, and is it sort of this breadth and diversity within the church, uh, just highlights sort of a lot of different, uh, gifts that God is like blessed people with. And those kind of are called into action. Cause I, I notice a lot of these different fraternal organizations, they do seem to highlight all good things, but different ones take preeminence among each one. Is that a fair Protestant attempt at characterizing those? Yeah, you're crushing it. So I would say the best analogy that would be, um, easily translatable to Protestant experience would be the gifts of the Holy spirit. So not the Isaiah gifts, but the Corinthian gifts. So the basic idea in you know Catholic speak, is that the Holy Spirit gives different gifts. Some of those gifts are for everybody. So we would say like grace is for everybody and virtue is for everybody and the Isaiah gifts are for everybody in the sense that God, God desires that all be saved and come to knowledge of the truth and this would be part of that entrustment. But then we would say there are other gifts which are just for some people, not in the sense that like God's um, making distinctions on the basis of like who he thinks is going to receive his gifts better, but that God is making distinctions based on his infinite wisdom and says to himself, this might be cool. Um, so to some, he gives words of wisdom. To some, he gives words of knowledge. To some, he gives prophecy. To some, he gives mighty deeds. To some, he gives tongues. To some, he gives discernment of spirits. To some, he gives interpretation of, you know, so like he, he sows the seeds of his wondrous works in differentiated fashion. And so the word that's often used to describe these different religious orders is charisms, and I don't think that's an accident. So we, we just say that they accent different aspects of the divine generosity or different aspects of the unsearchable depths of the divine wisdom and love. So that uh, like we, we seek to occupy a particular place within the mystical body, confident that you know while we're not hands or feet, we could be like really good gallbladders um, or... Like the gallbladder of Christ. <laughs> exactly. Yep. Or like pinky fingers um, or whatever else. You know, I think I just listed three vestigial organs, which seems to suggest that Dominicans aren't necessary regardless. So that's <laughs> that's like the closest the closest approximation. Oh, man. And and so the Ravenclaw uh, label comes to the fact that there is an academic emphasis and there's a lot of study. Could you actually regale some of our listeners just so they can have some confidence in what you're about to say? At the very least, that uh, a lot of people were paid to educate you on this, whether true or false. <laughs> uh, you had to study years of philosophy, theology. Um, yeah. You did not go to Hogwarts, but tell us a little bit about your right. education. My, my education was not unlike the education that one receives at Hogwarts insofar as it, the initial stages of it were seven years long before I became an Auror. Um, just kidding. Uh, so in, in our formation, we have two years of philosophy. This Hogwarts analogy has some serious traction. I'm going to see it all the way through. I just saw, um, oh man, I love it. We're just angering so many. I mean, I don't know when you become a Dementor. I'm also curious, was your school, did your school have multiple infiltrations by enemy agents? And when you look at that school, you yep. think, as much as I am fond of Dumbledore, his management uh, from a corporate pers from a corporate assessment is absolutely abysmal. I mean, teacher turnover in the dark arts yep. is, is awful. Yep. His students are constantly in danger. I mean, how many organizations would survive? I mean, a wolf or what is it, a, a dog, whatever um, Severus had transferred, had infiltrated 
uh, the campus. I mean, yeah, you have evil black. relics being stored there. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there's there's a lot of issues there. So hopefully your school was more uh, efficiently run. Yeah. Well, when you think just like about the defense of the dark arts teacher, what you, the first one is Quirrell, who is like possessed by the evil one. Yeah, totally compromised. <laughs> Second one is Gilderoy Lockhart, which is to say like the worst malignant narcissist of all time. He's Simon the Sorcerer who like wants to buy the power, right? And then the, the demon, or he's also that guy who goes, the demons are like, we've heard of Dumbledore and we've heard of Harry, but who are you? And then they jump <laughs> on him, right? And then it just gets different. You know, it doesn't get better. It doesn't get worse. Just get Mad-Eye Moody. That dude gets like bonked on the head within five seconds. And then Barty Crouch slips in. But he was and a then, mystic though. Bar Moody would have been a mystic, right? He, yeah, he's kind of the best of them. But unfortunately, he spends most of the book like in a trunk at the bottom of a staircase. <laughs> <laughs> Poor guy. And then what? It just gets it just gets worse. God bless. Like Dolores Umbridge. Not so good. Uh, whatever. OK, so um, two years of philosophy and then five years of theology. And um, the pontifical system is its own system. So it's kind of parallel to your typical bachelor's MDiv type thing. And we have our own language for it, but it's not important. So you don't need to remember it. Um, and then I was assigned for three years doing different things. And then I went and I studied for a doctorate at the University of Freiburg in Switzerland. So I studied dogmatic theology and um, specifically Christology. But Catholics like to do according to the thought of dot, 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 and pick out one you know, figure in the tradition so as to take him on as a master, as an approach to sacred scripture and tradition, but also to engage with his contemporaries and then with your contemporaries in light of that position. Not because it's necessarily like true in every aspect of the game, but it's largely true in, in my case. And then where it's wrong, it's helpfully wrong or illuminatively wrong. So yeah, I studied Christology according to St. Thomas Aquinas, who was also a Dominican. So there's kind of like the beat the chest, bang the drum, cheer for the home team type thing going on as well. Awesome. Now I do want to circle back because I think you might have been at school when the Jamaicans were competing against the Swiss uh, bobsled team in cool runnings. So we will... <laughs> We'll come back to that. So we should probably dive into some theology before we just go completely cut loose and off, go should off we? the deep end. Yeah, so. Oh, should we? I okay. don't know, maybe. So <laughs> let me ask you this. Uh, right off uh -huh. the bat, what do you wish people who don't, uh, and I'm going to put Protestants or anyone outside uh, just the Catholic faith, but what do you wish they understood more fully about your particular expression of the faith? Yeah, good question. Um, in terms of doctrine, like uh, the Catholic notion of mediatorship or instrumentality, I wish that were more widely known in Protestant circles. Uh, at the level of kind of felt need or personal sensitivity, I don't like being called an idolater. <laughs> so when you say media, what are, you t what are you talking about the, uh, the act of, uh, with confession? Or are you talking about intercession of the saints? Or what is, what is that particular referring to? It, it basically touches every aspect of the faith and the Catholic understanding. The big thing would be like, um, when you say, so you remember that Fort Minor song, which had like lists a bunch of percentages and then ends with a hundred percent concentrated power of will. It's like 15% something and 20% pain. Thus, but you comment, I remember the name, blah, 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 thus and such, yada, 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 hundred percent reason to remember the name. Okay. So that song is dumb, but it's also <laughs> helpful because it reveals to us the mystery of non-competitive causality. Um, because it's possible to have 100% of one thing and 100% of another thing and for you not to be talking nonsense. Like, for instance, I'm 100% the fruit of God's love for me. I'm also 100% the fruit of my parents' love for me. Insofar as they cooperated with God and they, you know, like God worked in and through them, not because he needed them, but because he wanted to bless them and bless me. Um, so I think that, like, basically every aspect of the faith has some some dimension or some facet of instrumentality that's at work within it. So it's like Christ, the church, the sacraments, sacramentals, prayer, veneration, and intercession of the saint, like all of it leans pretty heavily on instrumentality. And it's, it's a difficult concept. And I think that many Catholics get it wrong. So it's not like Protestants stink and Catholics are great. It's like, it's just hard to understand. But I think that if we were to work on understanding it, it would solve certain problems. So, so you have, you have stated in some other uh, Catholic uh, state-run media, um, <laughs> <laughs> love you, De La Cross, um, is that you have had a tougher time, honestly, relating to uh, Protestants and that you have an easier time relating to atheists or Catholics. And so uh, is that, uh, what is that rooted in? So I would say strengths and weaknesses. Um, strengths would be 
the, the type of discourse that is undertaken in my particular theological ghetto. So, I mean, like, I'm not representative of the Catholic Church, except insofar as I am a public representative of the Catholic Church. Whoops-a-daisy. <laughs> um, but I would say that I, I occupy a lowercase t tradition within the uppercase t tradition. And, like, the study of theology that I've undertaken for the past however many years is just part of the story. It's not the whole story. Um, so for people who run in my circles or people who live in my theological ghetto, we often um, we, we rely pretty heavily on like reason um, in the sense that a lot of what we do by way of theological discourse will sound like rationalism um, because the basic idea is that theology conducted in our circles, it departs from revealed principles, you know, from scripture and tradition, the subsequent clarifications of the church, but that it operates basically like philosophy. Um, which is to say in, you know, demonstrative form. So it just looks a lot like, you know, the type of uh, syllogistic reasoning that you see in a philosophy type text. Um, and my experience is, at least with the post-New Atheists, the New Atheists didn't care too terribly much for reasoning. They were more in the way of like shouting and banging saucepans, um, sometimes pronounced saucepan, if you're, you know, in the British Isles. And, and so, but like this kind of new generation of atheists prides itself on being serene and also being kind of transparent in the discourse. So saying like, these are the principles, these are how we have dialectically argued for the principles, and then these are the arguments, and we see these as issuing from the principles in this, that, or the other way, which I think is great. My frustration, I think, in talking to Protestants sometimes is that I don't know what the principles are, um, and I don't know whether the principles have been dialectically sifted. You know, it's like, what well, you can't really prove principles, right, because the principles, uh, but you can show how if the principles aren't upheld, then things go wonky, or you can show how the principles comport with reality in this, that, or that. Like, you can do dialectic. Um, and so I, I find that, that sometimes that's not the case. Like, I was stopped on the street one time by guys like, have you accepted Jesus Christ as a personal Lord and Savior? Upon which I responded. Um... You said Patronus Dominicus, right? Exactly. And then you and then you threw him into the sea. I said expecto patronum and the stag flew at the end of my wand. Expecto uh, magna deus. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, I pointed, for those of you who are listening and not viewing, I pointed at my habit and I said, no, I just like looking like an idiot. It's my favorite. And a habit um, to those who can't see or are unaware, I just learned what a habit was. A habit is the unique attire that separates you from, say, any other normally dressed person on the street. <laughs> Exactly. Um, and I was like, oh, no, like this is this isn't going to go well. Um, also, at the end of that conversation, I asked to pray with a guy and he said no, uh, because I was an idolater. And I was like, ah, such wounds. Um, but <laughs> but he was like he just asked me a bunch of questions and I should have been more disciplined and said, like, which of these questions do you want answered most so that we can devote adequate time to it? But I answered the one about maternal mediation, specifically about like the prayers of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And he's like, yeah, yeah. But that doesn't that just like doesn't obtain because you haven't cited enough scripture. And I was like, mm. <laughs> see, and I guess so that probably goes back because one of the challenges, right? Like in any court case, right, you have agreed upon evidence and both sides yep. get to provide each other. And I think perhaps one of the challenges, too, for Protestants and Catholics is that they're literally in many. And it's interesting to me that it seems that a lot of the sort of controversial um, disagreements that I would call intra-family disputes uh, tend to a lot of them center on things that are outside of scripture or the deuterocanonical and some of the um, apocryphal, at least from my own experience, I've asked some of my Catholic friends to say, why are you so you know, confident in the interpretation of purgatory um, or intercession of the saints? And many of them will cite, uh, I don't know if it's Tobit, Tobit. Um, I know Tolkien wrote The Hobbit. I wasn't sure if he had a sequel, um, assuming it's not the same, but I find that to be like particularly, you know, really interesting. So the problem, right, is that there's a whole just even the entire dynamic that what you're arguing is like you're not you're you're not even comparing apples to apples, right? It's just because one person's framework for truth is like, hey, it's if it's not in my Bible, it doesn't exist, right? Yeah, yeah. And the others are like, well, how did you? And you're asking a question, well, how did you get that Bible? And I do want to dive into that a little bit because even the story of Scripture, I think all people who practice Christianity should probably ask themselves, like, why do you, when you read that book and you ostensibly base your life on it, like, do you know where it came from? Like, how was it assembled? You know, I mean, cause we, we can disagree on what some of the stuff means, but like, how did it even come together? And I think that's probably one of the challenges. So obviously the big, big, probably the biggest issue of all is this idea of sola scriptura, which it's funny. It brings up a lot of interesting interpretations. And I think 
you can, I welcome you know, your thought on this if you disagree, but in my experience is the name tends to imply, or people tend to use it incorrectly and think that the Bible is the only source of theological knowledge when in reality, the correct application of this, right? Or what people I think are probably should more accurately argue is that the Bible they're saying is the only infallible source of theological knowledge, but that doesn't mean there is not a deep tradition of history and valid theological knowledge that comes from outside of it. Cause clearly, as I'm sure you can uh, attest, there are many doctrines that both of us would agree on that are not explicitly outlined in the good book. Is that correct? Yeah. I agree. I think um, the typical Catholic way of putting it, or a typical Catholic way of putting it, because there are several um, which are non-competitive or mutually enriching, is that you have our Lord, <clears throat> and then you have his express desire and then execution of the plan to institute means for the propagation of his divine life throughout sacred history, you know, downstream of the incarnation. And so... Uh, you talk about like the institution of the church uh, and then the institution of the sacraments as part of that, like the principal means by which that uh, promise of, you know, the propagation of divine life throughout sacred history is affected or realized. Um, and so like generally we, we talk about that as transpiring within the tradition. So tradition coming from the Latin tradere or the substantive traditio, which just means handing on. So what we're specifically concerned with is the act of communication and then the content of communication, but that the act of communication is principal insofar as it gets to, you know, like the word who is spoken uh, and who takes flesh in, you know, kind of various registers as it were. So obviously in a sacred humanity, but also in an extended way or in a subordinated way in his church and his sacraments and then in other good things besides. Um, so, uh, yeah, like tradition is the more principled concept in the Catholic mind because it speaks to the dispensation of divine life in the incarnate order. And then we speak of like maybe monuments of tradition is one way that it's formulated. Uh, so certain aspects of the church's life, uh, which give witness to this divine life as kind of concretized here, or as specified here, as whatever else. And so we refer to the sacred scriptures as like the principal monument of tradition. Insofar as, you know, the earliest scriptures, you know, like are written by what St. Paul in the late 40s or something like that in the latest in the canon or maybe late 90s or early 100s. We're talking about um, not the 1990s and the 1940s for those who are curious. Right. So, yeah, my bad. I yeah. should be more clear. That was Polly Shore. That was Polly Shore who was in the 90s. Sorry. Nice. Oh, wow. I haven't thought about him in a while. Um, and you probably was he half baked. <laughs> yeah, I, that and uh, in the army now. Um, okay. Yeah. It's been, I, didn't, I didn't see either of those. That was yeah. a little too. Yeah. Um, I was, but a wee lad. Uh, actually, one of my favorite uses of the word lad occurs in the RSV translation of the multiplication of loaves and fishes, where it says, you know, like Andrew says, there's a lad here who has five loaves and two fishes. And I think to myself, and he's wearing a kilt. Um, yeah, Andrew but, would be the Scottish, right? We don't know much <laughs> about Andrew, but we're going to just, can we have some origin story that somehow he was like dropped off by accident from Scotland and he kept his accent? And that would sure have so. you know? Yeah. There's, there's um, a lad here. He needs bread. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, so we think about the sacred scriptures as a monument of tradition because you have to account for the fact, you know, that the church antedates the penning of sacred scripture and certainly the consolidation or um, culling of sacred scripture. And then it's the church which safeguards the deposit of faith and subsequently communicates it. Uh, so like within the setting of this tradition and that it's like when we talk about the magisterium, it's as not like a check on, but as a way by which to make judgments on like what's in and what's out, whether what's in and what's out of the canon or what's in and what's out of the tradition or what's in and what's out of orthodox faith and practice. Yeah. So that's kind of how we see it articulated with tradition, scripture, and then the church's magisterium. Yeah. So I think one of the challenges too, is I think Catholics have a lot of really cool, fancy Latin words uh, that mm. obfuscate the meanings um, <laughs> that make it. So you guys sound more intelligent, but we would, exactly. for, it would actually help. Cool. It would help Protestants probably understand. So I think for example, just even learning like does the average Protestant know what the magisterium is, right? Could you actually just simplify and define the terms um, and maybe even go back a little bit. So in in a general mainline Protestantism, evangelicalism will bore all the kind of non-denominational. It's essentially that 
you've got the, you know, the Bible is the source of like our infallible truth. And it's this historical tradition that's been handed down with the Bible is like the, the top source of all and pretty much the only source of infallible theological truth. And then there's wisdom that comes from outside. And in the, and in the Catholic tradition, it's actually a different setup uh, based on the succession of Peter. So could you actually kind of just do the, the cliff notes of like, what is the magisterium and how does it actually yeah. work in Catholicism? Cause I, I was generally very interested to learn. I was like, Oh, you guys have a whole different pie to pick from too, you know? <laughs> um, so typically like Catholics will talk about the deposit of faith. Oh, Timothy guard the deposit. Um, and that would be what we're describing there is the divine life as accommodated to human recognition and reception. All right. And that means there are intellectual dimensions. There are volitional dimensions. Like it corresponds to our human nature. It's meant to be understood by us. It's meant to be assimilated by us. And we say that <clears throat> the deposit of faith, you know, we're typically describing it in terms of public revelation, right? So that public revelation ends with the death of the last apostle. So everything that you need, you know, the deposit of faith is present, has been explicated or exposited in some way, shape or form uh, prior to inclusive the death of the last apostle. And then what the church is responsible for in subsequent generations is the unpacking of or the kind of detailing of that deposit of faith. So you have within it everything you need, but it still stands to be appropriated by each subsequent generation. And in our engagement with that deposit of faith, we can do better and worse in how we recognize and receive it and subsequently, you know, transmit it to, to, to generation per generation. Um, and so, yeah, like that's kind of what we're doing in the tradition and that the tradition speaks to not just the monuments, but like the overall I've already talked about this. Now I'm repeating myself, but other big monuments of the tradition would be like the fathers of the church. So their reading of and commenting upon sacred scripture is a precious jewel in the life of the Catholic church. And all subsequent scriptural exegesis is basically downstream of the fathers of the church because they have a kind of share in an apostolic grace. So there's, there's a particular grace given to the apostles as, you know, the first bishops in the Catholic understanding, but as the first teachers and preachers of the faith, and that something of that is imparted to their disciples, right? You think about St. John and then, you know, St. Polycarp and St. Irenaeus um, as the, those who were closest to the Lord and received uh, an, a peculiarly efficacious grace of knowing him and loving him, which comes through in their subsequent teaching and preaching. Um, so then as the church kind of wends her way from age to age, you'll find false teachers who will crop up in her midst and will say, you know, they're out there saying that Jesus isn't actually God in the way that the father's God. He's subordinated to him. He's lesser in some way. There was a time when he was not dot, dot, dot. And so then in light of these, um, what would you say? Challenges to the church's faith, she will make clarifications and Typically, it's done in, in ordinary and simple ways where, like, the local bishop will just be like, stop that. Stop being silly. And then the person will be like, my bad. Uh, but then it can be done in more extraordinary ways where, like, the pope gathers with the bishops of the church in a ecumenical council, for instance. And then they will purposefully, deliberately ponder a particular issue and try to take the temperature of the spirit in effect, and then make a pronouncement upon what has been taught always and everywhere, which is one definition of the tradition by St. Vincent of Larens. So the idea is that the church isn't innovating, but she's discerning by the infallible grace of the Holy Spirit, what is in fact, you know, pertinent or what pertains to the deposit so that that can be clarified and explicated. So like you have Nicaea in 325 and Constantinople in 381 and Ephesus in 431 and then Chalcedon in 451 and dot, dot, dot. Actually, for the interested listener at home, I once memorized a mnemonic of the 21 ecumenical councils, which will come up in the clutch for you never, but that won't stop me from repeating Dude, it. Karaoke, it goes like this. Karaoke night, here it goes. Okay, here we go. So it just goes like this. Nico F. Cal, Coco Nico, la, 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 la. Fico, Flola, Trivava, which are the first two or three letters of every ecumenical council, which from the start goes Nicaea, Constantinople, Ephesus, Chalcedon, Constantinople 2, Constantinople 3, Nicaea 2, Constantinople 4, Lateran 1, 2, 3, 4, I forgot Lulu, uh, Lyon 1, Lyon 2, Vico, Vienne, Constance, Flola, Florence, Lateran 5, Tri, Trent, Trent, Vava, Vatican 1, Vatican 2. So if you ever need to situate yourself in, in history of the last 2,000 years, you can always, thanks, 
Thank you. I, I don't know that I was going to get a clap for that. I feel, I feel built Cla- up. A cloud of witnesses all just Bingo. applauding you. That's it. People are back in their homes thinking, somebody, somebody stop this man. Um, yeah, so that's like the, that the ordinary magisterium and then the extraordinary magisterium are the ways by which the church makes judgment as to what pertains to the deposit of faith and what does not, not because she's innovating or she's inventing, but she has the charism of infallibility from the Holy Spirit such that, that she can discern what has been taught always and everywhere, even when there's some ambiguity or kind of murkiness uh, in the, the years leading up. Got it. Is it is it bad that when you said temperature of the spirit, I did have a bad joke or my mind went to sort of what you do with heretics um, and sort of I got to say, it seems I would find something else to take a temperature of the spirit, given some of the historical treatment of challenges to the faith uh, that the church did, you know, so. There's a, yeah. you know, and now there's a difference between challenges and heresies, right? Uh, someone yeah. who's like, actually like you've been told you're wrong versus like, Hey, yeah. I just want to bring this up. Like, what if the earth is like not flat, you know, just want to throw it out there. You know, there's some, there's some stuff there. So maybe this would be helpful actually too. So this is where there's a huge gap. I actually think this would make a fantastic series on Netflix, like the second Pope, right? So, you know, Peter goes, right. So big, you know, Peter, it's like, right. Boom. Everything. It's like after acts, you know, we have some early letters from Paul and, but after Paul goes, right. And then tradition holds that most of the, uh, apostles, the original, the OG apostles, like the founders, mm-hmm. right. They are the founding board. They're all executed and martyred, save for one who may have escaped to exile. Um, which also there's an interpretation of verse, right. That, uh, he may still be alive, um, because death will not come to him until the generation comes back. Uh, I'll have to pull it up, but there's a fringe interpretation that John's somewhere out in the jungle, still writing, you know, just having a ball. But after wow. that, so after everyone's goes, what, like, what was going on in the early church here? Because obviously they didn't have Sunday school. They didn't have a Bible, wouldn't get one for a very long time. So do we just have, does each group of, uh, does each church in each city and area around the Middle East just have like a fragment of one of Paul's letters, they get together and then everything is just passed in a game of telephone. Like it is a miracle to me that this thing endured. So can you walk us through like what happened at like that point from after Jesus and the OG left? How did, how did, how did things go? (laughs) I don't know. Um, Great. (laughs) But I, I have some like vague recollections of things that I learned slash ways that we can piece it together sociologically and anthropologically. Um, So like, have you been to Rome before? Oh yeah. Um, have you been at the Church of St. Clement? I don't think I've been to the Church of St. Clement. I, I may have. Honestly, there's so many churches there, it's hard to keep track. There are, yeah. So there are four strata. Um, the lowest is a Mithraeum, uh, which is like a mystery cult of the first century, where they kind of worship slash kind of not worship the god Mithras. Uh, but then on top of that is the house church. And then on top of that is like a fourth century basilica and then on top of that, it's like an 11th century basilica. All of those numbers are probably off about a billion years. But um, it's roughly four strata. The lowest I know is Mithraeum. And then there are three churches, and the lowest is a house church. So I suspect that, I mean, in the early church, in a lot of these places to which the apostles were sent or their early companions, you had house churches, right? So you had small communities or small gatherings of Christians. And I can, I can, I can guess that in some of these places, they would have been very, very small indeed. Um, and that some of the, like the early work of the bishops and presbyters is to correct their worship and then to correct their manner of life. Certainly first Corinthians testifies to that in pretty awesome fashion. Um, and so, uh, there's an effort, it seems at the outset to make judgments, which have universal application, but within the particular setting and then appeals by some local churches. You see this as early as the first letter of Clement. Uh, which is written in the, like the late nineties, I want to say, uh, appeals to more, auth- you know, like as it were principled authorities or more universally recognized universal authorities for the settling of disputes. And obviously the, uh, interpretation of that text is controverted, but from the late first century, early second century, you have pretty good descriptions of the church's disciplinary practice, like the church's liturgy. You think they're of the Didache, which is subsequently expounded further by like St. Justin Martyr in the age of the apologists and the next generations of Christians. Um, and so it's, it's only really though with the Edict of Milan prior, to, or excuse me, just after uh, the Battle of Milvian Bridge where Constantine legalizes Christianity or 
decriminalizes Christianity, uh, that you see uh, a real flourishing of the faith in the open, because previous to that, you had state spot. Well, you had local persecutions of a very nasty sort, the most famous of which would be the Neronian persecution, but then state sponsored ones. So the Decian persecution of 250 to 251, the Valerian persecution of 257 to 258, and the Diocletian persecution of 303 to 311. So there's pretty concerted efforts to stamp out Christianity up until the very moment where it's decriminalized. And so I just don't I don't expect that you're going to see like big tent Christianity and living technicolor until the fourth century when it is, you know, decriminalized. And it's actually corresponding to that same time that you see Christians really making conscious efforts to live more deliberately or to live more intentionally their Christianity, because in the setting of persecution, you don't need too terribly much further encouragement to live intensely because the stakes are so high that your choice to be Christian is punishable by death. Uh, whereas in the fourth century, it's no longer punishable by death. So you see people going out to the desert of Skate, um, you know, like in present day southern Egypt or Nubia as a way by which to suck the marrow out of life, to quote Walden, you know, or dead poet society. Exactly. That's exactly what I was going for. Um, I sound my barbaric yop. Um, so, yeah. So I think that, that that'd be like a basic shape, but I'm not a church historian and I'm, I'm fuzzy on details. So, but it's probably just to help both sides understand each other better, right? It's like for a lot of people outside the Catholic faith, like you didn't, I mean, the thing is we get together in our group, we have a Bible on our phone, we have a Bible in print. I mean, I go to church and they'll say, please turn your Bibles. And I was like, why? It's on the screen. I mean, and there's literally the word of God is everywhere. And yet... Um, back then you had most likely, right. You had someone show up who had been ordained or been like basically elected. Hey, you're, you're going to be our representative here who had interacted with the letter. Maybe they had a copy of, you know, one of Paul's epistles, right. And they would have to extrapolate like a theology and a way of life without having mm-hmm. access to the whole Bible. And that's probably what maybe Protestants should understand, um, to help them mm-hmm. have grace for, uh, the Catholic side is that this, this idea that you could just get together and look at your Bible and say, this is what, this is what it means. Like there's no framework for that until this thing is assembled, you know, hundreds of years later. Right. I mean, this, yeah. this just doesn't, this, you just don't have access to it. Yeah. And I mean, the Catholic canon, we have 73 books. So plus seven, plus a little bit extra on the book of Daniel. Um, and the first time you see the list of 73 books in the Catholic tradition is in the fourth century. So it's one of like, I think it's St. Athanasius' Easter pastoral letter of, you know, one of the years in which he was the Bishop of Alexandria. He lists all 73. I think it's also in St. Augustine's De Doctrina Christiana. He lists all 73. But then it's stated explicitly in a local council of Rome by Pope Damasus I. And I think that's in like 382. Um, All of these are subject to revision. Fortunately, we all have the internet slash chat GPT. So you can check it just as soon as you hear it. and it's clarified by the church at the level appropriate to the clarification. So ecumenical councils are big deal type things, often enough with the, with the pope presiding as a solemn expression of the extraordinary magisterium, um, now that we have those, those definitions in place. But that, like, once the canon kind of coalesced or came together by the discernment of the people of God in accord with the infallible charism of the spirit, um, based on liturgical use and theological appropriation and the different ways in which the church engages with the sacred scriptures over the course of her life, um, it, it, it wasn't deemed necessary by the church to subsequently clarify the canon in an ecumenical council until Trent because of the Protestant challenge. So I think that that's also something that you hear, like the church didn't define her canon until the 16th century. It's not true. Like the church had her canon pretty clearly enunciated, you know, within the first few centuries of the church's life, but it wasn't necessary to promulgate it in the way, like in solemn state until such time as, yeah. Uh, yeah, the 16th century rolled around, it became necessary to do so. Um, and also just cause I want to make sure to get you to your prayers on time too. We'll, uh, we'll try and this is try and keep our answers to shorter, uh, oh, non, non Dominican answers. Um, so, so I can get you to No, this is, I knew this was gonna be a problem with you as I know we could, we could chat forever. There's so much. Oh my gosh. There's so much. It's, I find theology is like a hydra. You chop off one head to answer a question and three more pop up. Like, what do you mean by that? So, mm. um, I think, so is it fair to say though, too, because perhaps I think a valid, uh, challenge, at least in the sense that it might inspire some ecumenity and, and empathy is that while there is a canon of sorts and a recognition of what is scripture and also what is also not 
maybe fully scripture in the sense, but still useful, is that there does seem to be, from a Protestant perspective, widespread disagreement, even if general unity on a lot of big principles that there is, uh, for example, uh, I think it, I think it's Jerome, for example, who was openly critical of certain books being included. So, and that's not to say certain church fathers could have different stances. And then is it just in faith you trust that over time it kind of sorts itself out? Because I think a lot of Protestants look at that and go, sure, you can say that the canon was there, but then the early, you know, patronistic period, there was a lot of debate and disagreement and it seems like, okay, yeah, it's hard to put our trust in tradition as an infallible source of theology when there is just a lot of church fathers seemingly contradicting each other. Yeah, I can see that. I also don't know the particular details or I haven't gotten into the weeds too terribly much to sort it out. But from what I understand, the the kind of main points of contention, third, fourth, fifth century were New Testament books, specifically because there's this overlap between the Pauline, excuse me, the um, Joanine letters and Revelation and then some of these other writings which have eventually been ruled out. So like we've mentioned um, First and Second Clement, Shepherd of Hermas, the Didache, Letter to Diognetus, Letter to Bar- like these things are roughly contemporaneous, but they're ruled out. And I think that that's, that seems to be one of the central sticking points, whereas I don't think that Old Testament books attract as much attention insofar as that's been further along. But I I don't really know the whole of that conversation. So you're probably better versed in it than I am. Okay. Well, we'll can, we'll put a, we'll put a pin in that. We'll come back to it. Um, so I think, uh, you know, one of the things I asked you when I first met you that I just was so astounded by and have shared with several people, uh, when I told them I met a friar slash monk, uh, they were just like, what did you ask him? I was like, what would you, what knowledge <laughs> would you seek? And I was like, well, <laughs> like you would ask anyone, um, you know, any time you meet a, a man of, you know, purported spiritual wisdom is, you know, what are some habits, some disciplines? I, I'm pivoting a little bit here just because we're going to run out of time. What are some overlooked habits that you find would yield enormous fruit, you think, in the life of anybody, actually, not even just the Christian, but from what you look around, and I'll, I'll edit this because I want to rephrase this a little consenter, but like, we live in a world today that is just so technologically saturated, overstimulated, and you've chosen a really contrarian way of life. And with that, I imagine some particular habits and uh, no pun intended, uh, you know, some particular <laughs> practices that, you know, to help you feel closer with God, et cetera. So I'm curious for both the Christian and the non-Christian, um, what are some practices that you find are just enormously fruitful and help you feel like you're living closer to your original design? Yeah. Um, so I would say one big insight of religious life is that Christianity goes by way of the form of life. I think that there, there can be too much emphasis on willpower in Christianity. And uh, the problem with that is we play right into Satan's hands because he's like, step one, get them to rely upon themselves. Step two, get them to fail. Step three, repeat, leave them there. <laughs> you know, it's just like, yeah, lather, lather rinse, repeat. Um, Whereas I think that there's much to be said by being carried along. Like a lot of our Christian lives could probably be best expressed as like slipping on a banana peel and then finding that you're like falling upwards. It's like, ooh, it's a Shel Silverstein poem. Um, I thought it was a Mario but, Kart um, reference, sorry. Nice. Uh, but there's no like spinning around in circles and going. Woo, 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 woo. But then the Holy um, Spirit comes and just picks you up, right? And just puts you right. Okay, we're going to come right back. back on track. <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah, without losing any standing. Crazy. That's a problem. Um, and now you're talking Protestant. <laughs> bingo, baby. The restoration of all merits. Now I'm back in Catholic zone. Um, so, um, yes. Yeah, so I, I think that we, we could stand to gain from this idea of like form of life. So I, we all have like faint or pale shadows of it, but um, to really drill down on uh, not, not just like rhythm and discipline schedule, but also like community and ritualization and like lived intentional dependence and things like that. So like accountability part, blah, blah, blah. So I think that any ways in which we can adequately reflect in our environment, our human state as, as dependent rational animals, but as dependent rational animals on the way and in need, I think the better we do. So a lot of the wisdom of religious life is just to kind of like set people up to succeed so that they don't have to exercise willpower, not to enable them to become selfish uh, and self-centered, but to enable them to become generous within safe bounds, right? So the cloister isn't for keeping you in, the cloister is for keeping the world and its temptations out, not because you're not, you can't be made strong by the grace of God, but because you need to recognize that we're like still in spiritual infancy and we're drinking milk before we're eating solid food and that's okay, right? That's okay. Because if you appeal too terribly much to willpower, it just gets, gets uggo. Um, 
And then the last thing would be, well, it's the second thing, so I don't know if it qualifies as the last because you have to make at least a series of three in order to have a last. But regardless, my second point is that uh, recollection is another like precious fruit of the religious tradition that I occupy because the idea is to live constantly in the presence of God and then your times of dedicated prayer aren't like by way of, all right, let's get to prayer time, baby. Let's wall this off with sweet ramparts. But it's like a kind of diving deeper or dipping deeper into a recollection, which has accompanied you throughout the course of the day. And that helps you because you, you see certain obstacles no longer as like, um, you know, this guy over here just being a total fool. You know, it's like, oh, you see it as this is a way in which the evil one is seeking to rob me of my peace. And I can continually return to that peace because while, you know, um, things might go poorly or while there may be many like negative or otherwise distracting stimuli, yet I can cling to the Lord and I can recall my myself in his holy presence and, and profit from that because he doesn't lose his gaze, you know, on me. But it's it's for me to continually hold my gaze on him. And that makes a lot more sense of life. So those would be two small things. Oh, did you want to make a third point just so you had a complete list? Yes. Um, and my third point is, um, let's see. Um, so like dress. Okay. So we, we've talked about the habit and there's a thing about like people are like, oh man, don't you have so many sweet evangelical opportunities to talk to people about Jesus, which I do. Um, but that's not the first thing that I would think about when it comes to habit. For me, it's more so about identity and mission. So identity is so precious to the 21st century in all kinds of wild ways. Uh, but I think that we need a ritualized and incarnate reminder of who we are in order to abide in that truth. And that's not to say that you become a, like a billboard of religious proclamation. Like, I've got this sweet tattoo here, and I'm wearing this huge cross here, and blah, 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 and thus and such. I think Catholics are probably more prey to that than Protestants are. Um, but that we need to, like, um, have an outward expression of an inward devotion and that it needs to be organic, like mutually reinforcing so that my prayer and my devotion are given adequate expression by, by adoration and by sacrifice and by the offering of my life, which actually has visible elements. Uh, because otherwise I kind of, I become too intellectual in my faith and make it a matter of thinking myself through when truth be told, it's a matter of being carried through, albeit, you know, body and soul. Okay. All right. Super, super lightning round. I'm going to try and keep you to one minute. These are some good shorts. This is our social media mind thinking right here. We're going to bless as <laughs> many well. as we can. Um, okay. I want to like do, 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 do. All right. <laughs> We're live here with a friar here in the hot seat, which is a unique position for a Catholic to be in, right? <laughs> We'll cut that. Right, guys? Savage. No, uh, yeah. <laughs> and by cut that, I mean, let's, let's, let's double back let's, to that. Let's, We're actually going to make that the beginning and end of the episode. <laughs> um, okay. To anyone right now who says, you know what? I'm looking at not just faith in general, but particularly Christianity. It seems absurd. There's this guy out in the desert thousands of years ago. You yourself don't even have a clear idea of how the church was operating. And this is your life's work. Like afterwards, like, why should I give my life over to something that is so unproven, et cetera. Shouldn't I just roll the dice? Cause how could I really know, you know, couldn't there just as very well be, you know, multiple expressions that are true and, you know, and how do I, and your, and your faith seems to say things that go completely against my preferences, my natural desires, et cetera. So if you could tackle some of those and just speak to the true, uh, the atheist after your own heart. Yeah. I would say the Christian claim is radical and it's unique. There's no one else who claims to be, the only begotten son of God incarnate in human flesh who lived and died for love of you to save you from your sins specifically so that you might not fear eternal punishment, but rather hope for life eternal with him. It's just, it's a radical claim and it's unlike anything else. So a lot of people say like, you've got this, you've got the other thing, you've got this, that, the other thing, blah, 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 thus and such a variety of options, but there's no option that's quite like this. They're not on equal footing. And so there, I mean, CS Lewis said it best. He's either a liar or a lunatic or Lord. There's no other option. So I think that when we engage honestly with the Christian claim, uh, then we come to discover that we're up against it and that we have to pray for the grace to, to recognize and receive it in turn. But it can't be explained away. Why do you still believe after all this time? Uh, you can answer that question in a number of ways. Because like my mom, you know, um, because my parents loved me and communicated to me the love of God in a way that made it connatural, like a way that made it make sense. And so it's like something that I know in the marrow of my bones, even though I don't always have propositional knowledge whereby to express it. It's just like, yeah, I mean, I'm, it's just, it's a human way of, 
<clears throat> assimilating the faith and it's a human way of responding to it. But yeah, I think I can, I can, I can answer it that way. It's hard. Cause if someone says like, you know, father, like, how do you know, like an honest intellectual seeking, how do I know God's real? Like, how do I know? And then do you, do you, yeah. do you counter with, how do you know anything? How do you know your, <laughs> how do you know your conscious Other minds? Yeah, how do you know we're yeah. having a conversation right now? <laughs> you know, exactly. Association of ideas. Um, how do I, how do I typically respond to that? I would say, um, for most of us, we don't know, we believe, and those are different intellectual acts. So to believe is to think with assent. So there's actually a choice that goes into it. Now it's an informed choice because we can engage with, you know, like the, the faith as it's proposed, you know, according to the light of reason and say, all right, this seems coherent and this illumines our human condition. And there are also certain things that I can prove which overlap with faith claims. And there are all these signs which testify to the fact that there's something strange going on here. But at the end of the day, if I'm going to believe, I have to, I have to choose to believe, which also means that you don't fall into belief and fall out of belief in the way that you might fall into love and fall out of love. Um, it's interpersonal. It's always interpersonal. It's a holding to a clinging to for which you need to ask the grace because it's beyond our human resources. So it puts you in a bind, but a sweet bind provided only that it wears you down sufficiently so that you can ask for it. <laughs> <laughs> it is bonkers if you think about how we know anything. I mean, someone that, I, I forget where I read it, but someone's like, how do you know that what I think is red is what you think is red? Like we agree that we can both agree that's red, but I just don't know what you see. I really, I mean, that one really blew my mind. I don't know why, but it's just like, wow, there's so much that we just can't prove, but we just take for granted. So perhaps, yeah. perhaps God lives there. Uh, this is a more unique, this is actually, I, this is going to sound like a joke, but I mean this sincerely. So I am fascinated with slash have a tough time with the idea of y'all asking for prayers from deceased uh, people in heaven um, for the saints. Okay. Um, not in a small part, because I do wonder if I somehow make it to heaven, am I going to have to spend eternity answering prayers of people stuck on earth still? Right. Or not answer, but asking or praying for. I thought when I get no. to heaven, I get to start like doing all the works and you know redeeming the earth. But it sounds like in this thing, assuming I make it into sainthood, which I know is a big question mark, um, is am I going to have to now dedicate time to like praying for my small group still? Right. Um, so my my instinct is to say, don't worry about it. Okay. Um, because one. Uh, I think our bandwidth is increased to infinity in heaven, albeit within human bounds, so a kind of human infinity, which is a paradoxical thing, but a thing nonetheless. And also, I think that but like part of the drama of heaven is to be perfectly assimilated to the plan of God's providence. So we exercise a role in God's providence here on earth insofar as God deigns to work through us for the preaching of the gospel and the saving of souls, which is sweet. Um, but what we come to discover here, strangely enough, is that actually increases our capacity to experience human life, to accompany others along the way, etc. So it's, it's like when you find yourself drawn into the providence of God, it increases your capacity both for a certain efficacy and a certain joy. And I think that we'll see that dialed up to quote, this is Spinal Tap, to 11 when we get to heaven. Because I think as instruments of the divine providence, we will be perfectly assimilated to the Godhead so that he can act through us without hindrance or obstacle. And we, we consent to that or we cooperate with that perfectly such that our answering of prayers, oh, it, you know, it goes seamlessly. Not that it doesn't engage our will, but that our will is so perfectly attuned to the divine will that it just it hums right along. Um, so my inclination is to say, don't worry about it, because. If it's sweet for you to answer prayers while on earth, I think it'd be sweeter yet to answer prayers in heaven without anxiety or fear of limited bandwidth. I love that. Uh, how do you know if something is God versus the flesh, the enemy, uh, or just your own internal desires? Like the time I heard God say, buy a car. And I was like, maybe he did, maybe he didn't, but the smell of Bavarian leather really pushed me over the limit. <laughs> <laughs> um, short answer, I don't know. Um, and I, I, I think the, the type of certainty from which you can, or on the basis of which you can make these decisions, isn't mathematical certainty, it's a kind of moral certainty, so it's a certainty begotten by action, but action along the way. So I think that we often expect of ourselves certainty in an instant, but I think that falsifies our human experience because we as human beings don't live in the instant, we live in the passage of time, and I think we get clarity and conviction throughout the course of the passage of time. There's like a whole armada of emergency vehicles which are going by my window right now, so I just hope you can appreciate that as I much do. as I Someone am. Someone needs some intercession to the saints right now, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, so what are we talking about? Who am I? Uh, how are you, we're talking about just, how do you know if you like, what, what are the things that make you think this could be God versus my own just internal dialogue? Oh, right. Yeah. So I would say that the first thing is give it time. 
All right. And be patient with yourself insofar as God expects of you perfection, you know, in his time. God makes all things beautiful in his time. He doesn't expect perfection of you yesterday. And he increases your capacity for perfection insofar as he's infinitely generous. We're infinitely capacious and charity itself is infinite. So I would say that, like, make a decision according to your best lights and the counsel of those whom you love before, like, the Lord in prayer and then see what comes of it and then readjust. Um, so I think that where the Lord is, you know, where the spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. And also, you know, Galatians four and five, you like take your kind of fruits of the spirit inventory and make a determination. Is this the type of thing that begets faith? Does it beget peace? Does it beget patience and longanimity and love and other things besides? And if so, can I, can I actually have some moral certainty of that? Because while I don't know that I can judge whether I'm in a state of grace or not, I do think that I can make kind of probabilistic judgments like, huh, I was a butthead yesterday and I'm a little bit less of a butthead today. That seems like a positive indication. You know, it's better to make that judgment after months and years and so far as we can fool ourselves and it might be more a reflection of what we ate for lunch than it is a reflection of how we've responded to the grace of God. But nevertheless, give it time and then look for the fruits of the spirit and then head in the direction where the Lord is blessing. Mm. And then the other things will fall away. Amen. Well, I want to finish, obviously, with some just cinema, since you have some prayers to get to, like a good Dominican. Um, Thank you. So I guess we've we've hinted at the flaws in the Star Wars canon and the issue <laughs> with adding that. Um, as Do you find the Force to be woefully insufficient as a spiritual guideline? My, my I suppose what makes me nervous about the Force is that it seems like thoroughgoingly dualistic, which I think is a false metaphysic. Because it seems like at every point that you have it described, it's like Darth Vader is necessary in episode three because there has to be a balance struck in the force, but the balance needs to be struck insofar as there's too much good. It's like, what in the world? Yeah, right? Yeah. So like this whole idea, I think it, it makes, it, it reifies evil. So Catholics don't just use big words to describe tradition. Did you say re- reify? <laughs> Reify, yeah. So reum or reus meaning a thing, um, and then reify to thingify to make a thing which is not a thing. So you know, in our sweet Augustinian tradition, we would teach that evil is not a thing; it's the conspicuous absence of a thing. So we say it's a provi- privation of the good, right? So it names where a good ought to be present but isn't. So like blindness, for instance, is evil because we ought to be able to see, and when you can't see, we recognize that as an evil. Or like sin is an evil because it's a displacement or an upsetting of order that ought to be present in human action, dot, dot, dot. Okay. So I think they just, they just miss the boat on privation theory and they're all like evil's a thing and good's a thing. And they're just like locking horns in the middle of this here rodeo, which is the universe and dot, dot, dot. And I think that just makes it wonky from the start. Do you also find the Jedi to be particularly um, self-refuting in that they say only a Sith deals in absolutes? Like, do you think that was (laughs) intentional I'm like, as Lucas was kind of a student of like Eastern philosophy, I, I, I can't imagine that a man that sharp fell into the, like that is <laughs> I've heard interpretations that that's actually an intentional, like hint oh, okay. that like the Jedi are wrong, right? Like they, oh, they think that they need to bring balance when everything's good. They're just so God. arrogant and they like pushed Anakin into this. Like all they had to do was like invite Anakin in. That's not to, um, you know, displace his, his personal responsibility for turning into a murderer, uh, which also like yeah. episode two is pretty dark. Like we forget, like he actually murders all the young children in the temple. Like he gets okay. very evil. He gets, you know, pretty, pretty, pretty dark there. Uh, but you know, he does have a redemptive arc. And so do you think it's possible that Darth Vader as a Catholic on his deathbed could receive a indulgence um, or a, uh, some sort of remission of sins? And he found himself, although I take that back because his, his spirit does appear on Endor at the end. It does. So it does. Jedi, I was going to say, <laughs> Jedi do go to purgatory. <laughs> so, do you think the Jedi are in purgatory when they appear? Is that what's happening? So, great question. I think that's part of what's cool about science fiction is that it permits us to bracket certain aspects of real life. Um, and so, I don't, I don't know that we need to introduce purgatory into the uh, into the particular equation because I don't actually know what's going on in the afterlife. Now, I tend to think that it might just be a logical corollary of a universe in which there are rational beings who can choose for or against the good that some attain to a place of eternal damnation and some attain to a place of eternal salvation. And that it strikes me, you know, from my Catholic sensibilities, that there would be some need of ongoing purification for those who end in a basically good disposition, but with further attachment to their evil ways. So maybe I'm just like proving purgatory logically, which is just the, you know, the pitfall of a rationalistic Catholic. Um, But is there hope for the Jedi? You know, 
this whole like absorption to the force type thing is it's an interesting prospect because maybe maybe what we're getting there in episode four i mean that's such a a silly way to describe a new hope. I should just say a new hope because that acknowledges the existence of episodes one to three and then serializes things which came before them as if they were more principled. Sorry, I repent. Um, but the, the, like absorption into the force is the overall concept, right? And you either are absorbed in the force at some foreordained date where you willingly comply, not in capitulation, but in abandonment. Obi-Wan Kenobi, what a dude. Um, or it's your life is kind of wrenched from you. And maybe that's what's part of what makes the transition difficult for people like Mace Windu who are tossed out of windows. Um, uh, because you haven't yet given yourself wholly over to the Force. So maybe like the Jedi life is an outworking of Force reconciliation. And by the time that you're willing and ready to reconcile yourself wholly to the Force, then you can just pass seamlessly from this world into the next. That's my best guess. Interesting. Do you think Jesus could have said, if you strike me down, I will become more powerful than you can possibly imagine? <laughs> is that is that theologically accurate? Do you think we should go back and dub like the passion with, this is so horrible, but like, could you, I'm wondering if like Obi-Wan's like, you know, or is that basically what the saints were saying? Because St. Florian said something very similar, I think, before he was tossed into the fire, right? Okay, cool. Um, so my, my thoughts are, you know, the, those you who come after me will do greater things than these. Uh, maybe that's the Lord, but he chooses to associate it with his body than rather with, you know, like than, than just with the head itself. So maybe we already have that from the Lord's mouth, but not in the way in which it was spoken first or spoken cinematically, spoken second, spoken. Oh, gosh. As Abraham Lincoln once said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. I think that brings us home. It's uh, well, and, and I guess next time we can use Chewbacca uh, is indiscernible speech is probably a good reflection of what Paul was speaking about praying in tongues. And if there's yeah. no Han Solo to interpret, oh, right, then it's just uh, because honestly, some of the tongues I've uh, ostensibly heard people say when they show it to me it does sound very Chewbacca. Are you, you, is that so? Yeah. This, yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> but I guess Chewbacca and Glossolalia. But Luke, <laughs> but Luke does learn to interpret over time. And same with R two D two, who has sort of a you can. But the thing with R two D two too is you can actually infer his sort of emotional state. I know it's a machine, but like his beeps go up and down based on his like happiness or sadness. So mm -hmm. there is a way to actually infer from that. But anyways, we can process all that later. And we haven't even touched metachlorians and the uh, just uncelessness of them, <laughs> the, complete, the obsolescence of metachlorian. And yeah. yeah, so sounds like a Pfizer drug, right? So. Oh, gosh. Savage. Now we're now we're screened. <laughs> metachlorian are just as effective against COVID. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, you just got yourself a nice little warning on your YouTube posting. I know, trust me, Cheers this video is going to have to be so edited. So, Well, folks, <laughs> this has been a smorgasbord. <laughs> this has been a very Protestant conversation because I've essentially just decided where I wanted to go at any given time and just <laughs> taken my friend along for the ride. So if that's not Protestant, I don't know what is. So anyways, Father Gregory Pines, he's got to get to his prayers. Thanks for joining us. I can't wait. We're going to do more. And the fact that I know you're a Spinal Tap fan now, which is like yeah. in my canon of top 10. Mm. That's actually what our next episode should be is you you have your biblical canon and then what is the canon of cinematic literature or cinematic mm. truth that we can discern from because as you know it should say spinal tap and puppet show, right? <laughs> yeah, just as long as it includes best in show. Dude, that's oh my and, oh my gosh, that is my like we're all that's my family. We're all massive Christopher Guest fans. Like, you know, I told her I had two left feet. She thought I was kidding. I actually have just born with two left feet. The Busy Bee. Oh, my gosh. That family right there. You go back and get her Busy Bee. <laughs> Dude, that show. Oh, so good. So well, we've been camping kind of with Father Gregory Pines. Father, thank you so much for joining us, putting up with our shenanigans. We'll heavily edit this episode. Folks, thanks for tuning in. Talk soon.